message to all your friends saying, please like my page. That's what most people do, and certainly what I did when I started my page. So some of you may be familiar with uh, the things that I'm talking about in the talk, at least in the beginning. Uh, so stay with me to the end, and we'll, we'll get into some sort of the, the meatier parts. Now, I am not a social media marketer. That's not what I do, and that's not what I enjoy doing. So what I want to tell you about today was specifically my story as it relates to Facebook, and I think I may be a better person to listen to about this issue than social media marketers because I have nothing really invested in Facebook. I just want to find out the truth about what's going on on that platform. Now my uh, YouTube channel, this is what I do most of the time, it's called Veritasium. Uh, it has the Latin root veritas in there, uh, which means truth, which is something that I'm always trying to figure out. What is the real truth going on here? And, uh, and before I get into talking about Facebook, I thought I would show a little bit of uh, science to you. Just bring a little bit of science to your morning so you can see what I normally do. Uh, this is uh, one of my early, most popular videos. It's a very simple idea where I'm just holding a slinky. You guys have slinkies here, right? Yeah, that's good. So I'm just holding a slinky and it is dangling freely under its own weight. It's just hanging there. Now what I'm going to do in the video is I'm going to let go at the top and the slinky will fall. Makes sense, pretty straightforward. But the thing is we filmed this in a very slow motion, like 700 frames per second. So the slinky is going to fall very slowly. And what I want you to do before I play this video, I want you to predict how it's going to fall. So the top and the bottom, they're going to fall together, like spread out, like is slinky just fall like that? Or will the top fall faster than the bottom? Or the bottom goes up? I hear this a lot. It's just important to me that you make a prediction before I play the video. Because research has shown you don't learn anything if you don't make a prediction. Has anyone seen this video already? My true fans, thank you. Achoo, yes. Awesome. All right. Has everyone made a prediction? Let me show you how a stretched out slinky falls. Are you ready? In three, two, one. Ooh. See that bottom there? It doesn't move at all. It just hovers until the whole slinky collapses, which is quite counterintuitive which is, I think, why this video was so popular. Now, you know, if a small slinky is good, then I think a large slinky is even better, right? Yes. And uh, what's interesting to me about this is that this is a property of all objects, not just slinkies. So if you took a long metal rod and you let it go from the top the top really starts falling before the bottom starts falling. This is a, a true feature of everything in our universe. It takes time for a signal to propagate through the material. It takes time for the forces to change. And I, I really like this view. We see that how long it takes for that uh, compression wave to come down from the top. It takes about a third of a second in real time. But what's interesting to me is that here, the bottom starts rotating first before the compression wave gets there. You see the bottom starts rotating right there. So there's a wave which is a twisty wave which makes it down to the bottom of the slinky before the compression wave, before the top of that slinky barrels into it. So this is a modeling that I So I just wanted to give you an idea of what I do most of the time. I'm interested in science, I'm interested in physics, and I have a YouTube channel and uh, I've got a couple, in fact, and together they have a one and a half million subscribers. This makes me in the top five educational channels in the world on YouTube. My videos have been seen over 72 million times. And of course, it makes sense, like anyone nowadays, you have, a, you have presences on all different social media. So I've got Twitter and Instagram and, of course, Facebook. And at the beginning of this year, I had about 109,000 page likes on my page on Facebook. But when I posted a new video, 
to my fans, Facebook told me that video is only being shown to less than 9,000 people. Could be anywhere from 3,000, 6,000 to 9,000 people. And to me this seemed a little bit strange because I had worked hard to get these 109,000 followers and now when I post a video, which presumably they want to see, you know, only five to eight percent of them are really seeing it. So that's really when I started trying to figure out what is going on with Facebook. What is the problem with Facebook? I think a lot of you probably have seen this decline in, in the ability to reach your fans, right? Have you guys seen this? And Facebook talked about it, in fact. They published a, a little report, and the, the idea of this report was people are posting a lot more on Facebook right now, so we have to limit what they see, otherwise they'll be overwhelmed. And so they, they had this advice for pages. They basically said, we expect organic distribution of an individual page's posts to gradually decline over time as we continually work to make sure people have a meaningful experience on the site. Right, so they've got a logic there. We are just trying to help people with a busy news feed. Everyone wants to be in the news feed, but you can't be, because otherwise the, the viewer would be overwhelmed. I think this is an interesting kind of view, because there's other social media like Twitter, and Twitter doesn't filter your feeds. I mean, you can pick who you want to see, and there's no filtering of, of that process. Same thing happens on Instagram, at least for now. Everyone you follow, you get to see all of their photos. Same thing happens on YouTube. Anyone you subscribe to, they come up in your subscriptions feed. So Facebook has taken an interesting approach by saying they are going to be the ones to determine what is interesting to people. They're going to decide what goes in your news feed and what doesn't. And I think fundamentally, the reason they've decided to do this is because Facebook needs to make money. And they've decided this is the way that they're going to do it. I am not some kind of crazy idealist. I understand that Facebook needs to make money. They provide a valuable service, and they should have a workable business model. They should have a way of making money. The thing that I'm curious about is whether they have picked the best business model whether they have picked something that really works for all of their stakeholders, for all of the individuals, for all of the creators, people like me, or artists, or bands, and all of the brands as well. That's my question. Now for me as a YouTube creator, the idea of a, a working business model is a very interesting one, because when I, when I think about it, on YouTube you have a situation where for every view, creators get paid. So there's kind of this money flowing through from the views to YouTube, and YouTube pays the creators proportionate to their views. On Facebook, we've got quite the opposite, right? We've got the creators, like me, pay Facebook to try to get our content shown to people. And I was thinking to myself, why is it different? Like, why, why does the money flow in completely opposite directions in these two different platforms? Obviously, for one thing, people go to Facebook mainly to look at what their friends are doing and what their family's doing. People go to YouTube to see content from cool creators. So obviously there's that distinction. There's also this idea that on Facebook, um, the interactions are very brief. So people only see a post very quickly, whereas on YouTube, people will be with you for a number of minutes. And you can clearly see by the ad at the beginning, you know, how much revenue has been generated for YouTube uh, through that view. But I think most importantly, these two different sites treat their entities differently. Let me explain what I mean. On YouTube, you have advertisers who are quite obvious. They make those ads before the video that you can skip, or the little banner pop-ups. And then you've got the creators, which are actually a pretty small group who are watched widely, uh, people like myself. And then you have a very big pool of viewers. And of course, the advertisers want to get through to the viewers. Now, what's interesting about this situation is that the incentives of all parties are well aligned. So the advertisers are happy to pay YouTube, YouTube then pays some of that to the creators, and the creators make the content that get the views. And it all works in this beautiful uh, sort of synergy, like there's a, there's a clear 
through line here. And because the creators are getting paid, there is a constant incentive for creators to make better and better content. And for more creators to come into that pool and try to increase the level of content. That means there are more viewers who are interested in seeing that content. Which means there's more advertisers who are interested in putting their message in between. So they're interested in paying more to YouTube. So basically what I'm saying is this system suits everyone. Except for, of course, the annoyance of the five seconds for the viewer before you skip or you know, having to watch some of those non-skippable ads. So there's a, a little bit of annoyance for the viewer, but in general, this system works for everyone. Now, if you think about how this works on Facebook, you have the similar kind of groups. The creators are people like myself, or bands, or um, artists. The advertisers, again, big brands, and then you've got the viewers. Now, the issue, what Facebook is trying to do, is they're treating the creators as though they're advertisers. So if I really want to share with my, my fans, Facebook is saying you should be willing to pay for that privilege. So basically, all creators are, in essence, advertisers. We are just trying to get our message out. So they make no distinction between artists and, say, Coca-Cola, right? But what's interesting is that the viewers are also creators, because everyone on YouTube makes content. They post pictures and status updates and everything like that. And so the viewers are, in fact, also advertisers. So it seems to me that Facebook's solution to how to monetize their platform has been to treat everyone as an advertiser. So we are all advertisers on Facebook, and I think that is a fundamental problem with Facebook, because I don't think that aligns the, the expectations and the goals of each party. Now, the reason they've done this, I think, is because those sidebar ads and the other types of advertising that Facebook have are pretty ineffective. They get only about 0.05% click-through. That could just be largely accidental clicks, right? Compare that to Google, where they get 2% click-through rates. So the point being, because Facebook could not generate revenue in this way, they've moved to using the news feed as their central place to generate money. Right? That's where Facebook generates value, is in the news feed. But that means everyone is an advertiser. Everyone has to basically play the same game. And that includes individuals. A lot of people don't know that you can actually pay to promote a personal post. So the viewers, the individuals, can actually pay to promote you know, a picture of them on holidays, or if they've just got engaged, or something like that. To me, that seems seems odd. And I mean, it's making it harder for the creators to reach the viewers. Like me, I find it hard to reach my fans. And for the fans, it goes against their expectation. Their expectation when they liked my page, for example, was that they were going to see all of my updates. And now they don't. I mentioned that you can actually pay to promote personal things. This is my personal Facebook. This is a time when I met uh, Bill Nye the Science Guy. I don't know if you know this guy, but he's pretty popular in the science world. And uh, at least in Australia, you can actually pay to promote a personal post. So if I pay Facebook $7, it says, uh, now you can help promote this post to move it higher in friends' news, news feeds and help them notice it. And I think that seems desperate. Like, why should any individual ever pay to promote something? It seems lame, right? So this is part of the problem with Facebook. Everyone's an advertiser, including you, including me. Even if you don't have a page, everyone is an advertiser. Now, what if you want to have organic success? What if you want your post really to get out to, to the most people? Well, Facebook has basically one metric for determining whether something is worth sharing organically or not. And that one thing is likes and comments. It's engagement, right? The one thing that you can get is engagement. But to me, the posts that get the most engagement are not necessarily the best posts. So have a look at this example. This is one that I saw. Um, this was posted on a popular science site. It said, put it in the oven at 120 degrees. And I think it's a lasagna and a protractor. And they've oriented the lasagna at 120 degrees. Okay, This thing, which, you know, is kind of funny, but not really, uh, received about 120,000 likes. 
Yes, this is a popular, popular post. And to me, this is a concern. Because if engagement is the only measure of success, and Facebook filters your newsfeed, what you're going to see is babies and weddings and things like this. Because these are the things that get engagement. So I think that this business model doesn't really suit anyone. So as I said, most creators are reaching around 10 to 15% now. And we know that over the next few years, Facebook is going to try to reduce this. Because the only way to make more money is to reduce organic reach of posts, forcing creators and brands to pay to have their message spread. So we can really just expect this to go down and down. Now, I was talking, to this, talking about this with my friends. And I said, look, I'm, I'm not happy with the amount of reach the Veritasium page is getting. And some of my friends said, I'm getting a lot more reach than you are. Why are you getting such low reach? And I, I started to think about it. And I, I wanted to look into my data a little bit more closely. You know, I remember that two years ago, in, in May 2012, I got an email from Facebook, and it said this. Well, it, it basically said, we'll give you $50 worth of free advertising to promote your page. It sounded good. At the time, I only had about 2,000 likes on Facebook. So I thought, OK, well, I can take them up on this $50. I mean, what, what's there to lose, really? It's $50 free. But I didn't really know what I was doing. So I sent this coupon to a friend of mine who had worked much more in Facebook marketing. And I said, just spend the 50 bucks and you know, see what you can do. And what happened? Well, starting at about 2,000 likes in May 2012, within a day or two, I was watching that number rise by the thousands. And it was really quite exciting. Yes. I mean, at the time, I had 40,000 YouTube subscribers. So I thought, surely, I am reaching some of the people on Facebook who I also have on YouTube. This is going well for me. And over the next few months, this number by Facebook advertising actually grew up to about 80 to 85,000 likes. So I really grew the likes fast and incredibly. So everything looked good. Unless you consider who I was reaching. Because in May 2012, when I had just 2,000 likes on the page, I would reach on average about 4,000 people when I made a post. That's because the posts would do really well, and they would get spread to the friends of those people who liked my page. If you fast forward to December 2013, when I had 109,000, I would only reach about 6,000 people. So it seemed quite strange. And, and my YouTube channel had grown a lot in that time. If I show on this same graph the number of likes that the page had, that the Facebook page had, you see this. So I used to have a few likes and do decently with reach. And now I have, well, at the beginning of this year, I had a lot of reach, or sorry, I had a lot of likes, but not very much improved reach. So to me, this looks really suspicious. And so I decided to dig deeper. I mean, what really happened on Facebook. So I, I looked at the stats that Facebook provides for where my likes are coming from and, and where the engagement is coming from. And I made this graph. So on this graph, every country is represented by a bubble. This is uh, Canada. And the size of the bubble represents the number of likes that I've received from that country. And I position the country on the horizontal axis according to what percentage of my fans from that country have engaged with at least one post this month. So you see that Canada is over 30%. This is the United States. It's also over 30%. This is uh, Germany. So I had very engaged fans in Germany, and even more engaged in Austria. This is uh, nearly 60%. They were my most engaged fan group. Thank you to any Austrians in the audience. Uh, in fact, these are all the, the big Western countries who had liked my page. Uh, and so you can see that it's pretty standard for me to get between uh, sort of 15 and 45% of my likes to engage with a post in a month. OK. Let me reset the scale here a little bit. And now I'm going to show you Egypt. This is Egypt. It was my largest number of likes were from the country of Egypt. But they engaged less than 1% of them 
would engage with a post in a month. This is um, India. This is, that's the Philippines. This is Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. I had a huge following in these developing countries, and I had no idea. I mean, I never looked at the data that closely. Facebook is not what I do. YouTube is what I do. But when I started digging into the Facebook data, this is what I found. If you count up all of these people, I mean, all of these likes are behaving very, very differently from the rest of the countries, right? Where I can trust those are real people. What, what is going on here? You count up all of those people, that's 80,000 likes. Where did these 80,000 likes come from? They came when I paid for Facebook advertising. Obviously, we had not been very careful with how we targeted our campaign. But, I mean, for one thing, this was May 2012, so people weren't as aware of the problems as they are now. But the other issue is that my brand is global. I have fans in Egypt and India and the Philippines. I have lots of real fans in these countries. So if I excluded them from my, my targeting, I would have been excluding real fans. Anyway, this is what happened. We paid Facebook a couple thousand dollars, and what we received was 80,000 likes, which never engaged with a post. Well, barely ever. Now, you might think that's a big waste of money, but in fact, it's worse than you think. Because the way Facebook's algorithm works, what they do when you make a post is they only send it out initially to 1% to 3% of your fans. When you first make a post, it only goes to 1% to 3%. What Facebook wants to do is gauge the reaction of those first few fans. Now, if they, if they see that your fans are liking it, they're engaging with it, they're sharing it, then Facebook sh spreads it out. They share it out to more people. And that kind of makes sense. In a world where all of your likes are real people, your better posts will be shared more widely, and your worst posts will be limited in their reach. And so this makes sense. But what happens if you reach some fake likes? If you have some fake likes, then when Facebook first sends out the message, it's going to go out to fewer real fans, which means it gets spread less. And so by gaining these fake likes, you actually reduce your reach. So this is the way you can watch likes on your page go up, and yet your reach is going down. What would you do in this circumstance? I mean, if you had money, and you were having a tough time getting reach, you might just pay Facebook to promote your post, to try to get it out to more people. So what's happening to Facebook here? They will take your money to help you acquire fans, some of those fans may turn out to be less than genuine, which will make it hard for you to then reach them when you make a post. So you pay Facebook again to try to reach those fake fans. So from this whole process, Facebook is making money twice. This is the problem with Facebook. So these 80,000 likes, they're not behaving in a way I would consider genuine. But there is a bigger question here, which is, who are these people? Honestly, who is liking my page? Who are these 80,000 likes? The answer is click farms. This is the idea that in developing countries, there are some businesses which are set up to make you look good on social media. So let's say you created a new Facebook page. You could go to a site like this, Boost Likes, and you could pay them, say, $500 for 10,000 likes. And this page will deliver those likes to you within 45 days. How do they do it? They've got employees in developing countries who run a number of Facebook accounts, 
and they will log in over those 45 days and they will randomly, you know, click like on your page, building up those pages likes. Obviously these likes are useless. They're not really good for anything, but if you just wanted your page to look impressive, this will, will get the job done, all right? I should maybe point out, a, there's a little, uh, little note on this page. It says, new targeted USA fans. If you toggle that switch, you can get fans only from the United States if you want your fans to look more real. And then they like double the prices here. I'm not joking. So it's harder, obviously, to get fans within the US, but you can pay for that because there's a market for it. But I did not pay for fake likes. I did not go to a website like this. I paid Facebook and I said, Facebook, promote this to people who will be interested in what I do. But what I got was essentially people from here. So the question is why? I, if, if no one was paying these people, why were they clicking like on my page? The best hypothesis that I've seen is that I'm kind of collateral damage. So let's say there's a, a click farm in Egypt and someone in Canada pays for likes. A company in Canada pays for likes. If Facebook saw this kind of traffic, all of these likes coming from one specific place to that company, they'd be suspicious. So that company, in addition to clicking like on the company that they've been paid to click, they click like on random other things, which included me. Why do they click like on me in particular? Because I was advertising my page, which means the page comes up in the sidebar. So you imagine one of these employees in a click farm would just click, oh yes, and I'll like this one too, to make them seem more like a real person. This is the problem of the like farms. Their detriments are not restricted to those companies uh, that pay them. They also inflict random damage on any Facebook page. So there's pages like Facebook Security. Facebook Security is most popular in the city Dhaka, Bangladesh. This is one of the biggest cities for click farms. What about the Google page? Google's Facebook page, most popular in Dhaka, Bangladesh, right? These click farms are just clicking what's easy. What's easy? Facebook security, Google's easy. What about uh, soccer star David Beckham? He's most popular in Cairo, okay? But you take my point, in all of these developing countries, there is some, some activity on Facebook which is not genuine, and it's not being sorted out. You might think the solution is simple, that when you go to uh, promote your page, exclude these countries. That's a good first step. If you don't care about these countries, you should definitely exclude them. Um, but the problem is worse than that. I realized that when I saw the page Virtual Cat. Has anyone here seen the page Virtual Cat? This page is terrible, okay? I mean, the pictures of the cats are not even very good, right? Like, there's better pictures of cats on the internet. Give me a break. And, uh, and, and if you read what it says in the description, it says, virtual cat is a virtual pet like none other. Here we'll post only the worst, most annoying drivel you can imagine. Only an idiot would like this page. Honestly, who would like this page? Or a better question, who would make this page? The answer is, I did. I made this page in February. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I made this page as an experiment, right? I made, I made a blank page with a stupid title and a stupid picture and nothing posted on the page. And the goal that I wanted to achieve through making this page was I wanted to see how many people I could get from Egypt, Indonesia, the Philippines, Bangladesh, etc., to like this page. Because I thought, I want to really show that there are fake likes happening. But the first thing that I did was when I promoted the page, I didn't promote it to those countries. Instead, I promoted it only 
to people in the United Kingdom, the United States, Australia, and Canada. And I promoted it to specifically cat lovers in these places. I don't know why I, I promoted it here first. I guess I wanted to show to myself that there were no fake likes in these countries. I basically wanted to show, okay, I put a budget in of $25. I want to show that I can get no clicks from these countries because it's a stupid page. But then when I go to promote to the other countries, I'll get a lot of clicks. This is what I expect when I, when I made this page. But to my surprise, I submitted my first ad to Facebook, paid $25, and within about half an hour to an hour, I had 262 likes, and all of my budget was gone. So I spent this budget very fast and got 262 likes. It's a bit odd. So I went to see who are these 262 people. I'll show you one of them. This is uh, one of the, the people who liked my page. They look kind of genuine, and there's nothing, you look at this page, you don't say, okay, well, it's obviously not a real person. She has a, a nice picture, I guess. Um, she's got friends, she's got history. So you might think, okay, maybe, maybe she's a real person. She just likes virtual cat. Yeah. Uh, she likes 37,000 things. And everyone who liked Virtual Cat liked more than a thousand things. I tried looking at how many things do I like? I like about 20 things on Facebook. Some of them are the things I've been forced by my friends to like. Who likes 37,000 things? And if you like that many things and Facebook is filtering, you'll never see any of my posts because there's too many options for Facebook to choose from. So. So this is not a real person. I looked at some other people. This is scrolling through the likes of, uh, of another one of the fans of Virtual Cat. Doesn't seem to want to. The things that they were liking were really odd. Now we're going too far. Okay, I'm back in control, looks like. There we go. Okay, so this person in like one account liked a whole bunch of competing brands. You know, they would like uh, different telephone brands. They would like, Vodaf or like uh, Volkswagen and Lexus and Mercedes and just any car brand. It, it didn't seem to have any, it didn't make any sense. A lot of people would like different restaurants, like small restaurants in a variety of different cities, like all over the place. The point is, it's not completely obvious that it's a fake person. So I think like Facebook may not even know, is this person real or fake? They may be operated by a real person, this account, but the likes are not the behavior of a real person. That I can guarantee you. So I sent out this post onto the virtual cat page. This is the first post I made. And I said, please help. This page is actually an experiment created by Veritasium, a science YouTube channel. If you can see this post, please comment briefly and let me know why you like this page. Because the page is intentionally blank and meaningless. The experiment is to find out who would like a page like this and why. Thank you. So I had 262 fans at this point. Facebook showed it to eight people. Facebook showed it to eight of those profiles. That's 3%. None of those profiles liked it or commented on that post, so that post died there. That was it. So I made some videos about this, and they did pretty well, and I wanted to talk about the response. So. The, the response to the videos was pretty overwhelming. There were two videos about uh, problems with Facebook that I uncovered. They were seen three and a half million times, and I got 116,000 likes on those videos and uh, less than 1,000 dislikes. And if you know YouTube, that's pretty extraordinary. I mean, my science videos don't do this well. 
They, eh, some of them, but mostly this is extraordinarily uh, a powerful endorsement of people of these videos. And to me, it suggests something that Facebook should be concerned about. Not these, I mean, they should be concerned about the problems I'm talking about, but they should also be concerned about the sentiment that there's a lot of consumers who are currently anti-Facebook. And that segment seems only to be growing. And I think it's because of things like the problems that I've mentioned. So I went on Fox Business, and I talked about this problem. I spoke about it on BBC Radio. And uh, it was picked up by Mashable and Reddit and a whole bunch of other sites and traditional media, the Sydney Morning Herald, which is the newspaper in, uh, back in Sydney. And what did Facebook say? Facebook did not respond. Facebook did not respond to my requests. I wasn't saying, give me a refund or anything like that. I was saying, help me delete 80,000 likes from my page. Because Facebook does not allow you to do that. There's no bulk tool where you can say, you know what? Everyone in Sri Lanka, I just want to wipe them from my page. Because they don't seem to be real. That's not an option. So I tried to get help from Facebook. Facebook did not get in touch. However, Facebook did provide a statement to the reporters who had asked me questions. And I wanted to share with you some things that Facebook said. So this is from Facebook's statement. They said, he created a low quality page about something a lot of people like, cats. They may also like a lot of other pages, which does not mean that they are not real people. Lots of real people like lots of things. <laughs> this, is the, this is what Facebook said. And this is something that I think, I hope you guys understand why the page was low quality. Like that was the point of the page. Make a page that no reasonable person could honestly like. But some people get stuck on that and they're like, why did he make a bad page? It's like, that's the point, that's the experiment, okay. Um, but, but Facebook makes this claim, lots of real people like lots of things. Now that is a claim that you can check. There's statistics on this. And in fact, the average person likes 40 things. 40. Here's a graph. In the United States, that's where people like the most things. They like 70 things per person on average. Now, I question that because you saw that click farm where you could select American-only likes. To me, I would imagine that some of those 70 likes per person are coming significantly from fake people. In most countries of the world, people like less than 20 pages, 20 things or below. So to me, that seems like the kind of level that people are liking. Maybe some people who are really excited could like 40 or 100. But when everyone who likes your page likes 1,000 things, those are not genuine people, in my opinion. Facebook also says, his example about the Veritasium page is nearly two years